Okay, everyone. So it's a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who I'm sure all of you, of you know by name. And he's one of the very first researchers in the field since the 1990s, and has many uh, algorithms and pro protocols to his name, and will teach us about some recent ones. So it's a great pleasure, Richard, to welcome you here. I hope you're enjoying the conference. Great, well thank you very much. Uh, is this okay? The, yeah. So it's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to visit Parati, a beautiful place in Brazil. Um, so, okay, so I'll, I'll be talking about classical simulation of quantum circuits. And, and you may think that this is perhaps a rather specialized subject, but I think there are at least two very good reasons why it's very instructive and a good thing to, to learn about. Um, the first is that it's, it's one of my most favorite and long time lines of research, but that may not be a good reason for you to study it. But I should point out, uh, sorry, yes, uh, <laughs> thank you. So um, I, I should point out that it is particularly interesting because it directly addresses some of the most fundamental and most interesting issues of all of quantum computing, namely, what are the origins of the benefits of quantum computing over classical computing, if, if there indeed are such benefits, which hasn't been proven for sure, which is slight embarrassment for the subject. Um, <clears throat> and furthermore, it addresses them in a very precise mathematical way. Um, often questions about quantum computing power are phrased in very vague terms. You, you know, it's very soon people just mention the magic word entanglement and as though that kind of covers everything. But in fact, I want to devote most of this first talk to issues of entanglement in quantum computing. And we'll see that the question is in fact extremely subtle and complicated and difficult. And basically, at the end of the day, it's completely meaningless to ask or to claim that, that entanglement is the origin of quantum computing benefit, as we'll see, for various reasons. Um, so even if you don't, you know, like the subject of classical simulations, uh, another good reason to study this subject is because a lot of constructions and techniques and tricks that we use along the way are uh, used very much in, in lots of other areas of quantum computing and quantum information theory, and it's a great opportunity to get some exposure to them and you know, see them in action in, in, in this context. Uh, okay, so a you know, very brief outline there of my three talks. Uh, today, I'll be talking mainly about some very basic background definitions of circuits and complexity, and then mention some interesting results about entanglement and its relation to quantum computing. And in the subsequent lectures, I'll speak mainly about Clifford circuits and then and match gate circuits, because there's lots of interesting aspects there. I'll just pick a few of my favorite aspects to talk about. Um, but before we get started, uh, just a little bit more about you know, this issue of context and significance of, of this subject area. So we have these rather vague questions like, you know, how can we compare classical and quantum computing power? What quantum features provide the, you know, the benefits of quantum computing? And this is where people often just say entanglement. Um, and the point here is that, you know, the, the notion of classical simulations, as we'll see, uh, provides of restricted classes of circuits, as Ernesto was kind of mentioning yesterday. It provides a mathematically precise uh, approach to these very loosely formulated and vague questions. Um, and you can explore the relationship between classical and quantum computing in, in both directions. So I say from above and below, um, you, can, you can provide evidence that some classes of quantum computations are hard to simulate classically and therefore provide you with some computing benefit. In, in complexity theory, hardness of, com of computing something is notoriously difficult, or rather impossible in a word, to prove. So as we heard yesterday about, about P and NP, you know, problems in NP are hard, but no one 
just prove that they're hard. You know, we just might not be clever enough yet to figure out how to solve them quickly. But um, we have no proof that such a thing can't be done. So similarly for quantum computing, and um, and this notion of classical simulation will will still provide hardness evidence in a kind of indirect way. Namely, we will prove results like that if you could classically simulate a certain class of quantum circuits, then that would imply a result back in classical complexity theory that P equals NP. So therefore, we expect the, the quantum simulation not to work, you know, the classical simulation in the quantum context, because it implies something that we believe not to be the case in, in the classical context. And conversely, we can develop interesting classes of um, quantum computations that can be classically efficiently simulated. In other words, they don't provide extra computing power. So you might think, well, that's boring. Why, why do we want such things? But they turn out to be very interesting as well because, first of all, they can involve rich quantum effects, lots of entanglement and all sorts of other quantum effects. And, and it kind of indicates how rich the relationship is between classical and quantum computing. And, and they're also interesting because they relate to other aspects of uh, other areas of physics, in particular quantum many body physics, solvable models of, of various kinds of local Hamiltonians and other situations are closely related to classes of quantum circuits that can be efficiently simulated. And in many body physics, we are very interested in, in models that are solvable. So, so this provides an interesting link there as well. Um, so, so we have these rich quantum effects, and we have this um, rich structural relation that we'll see a lot more of. And, you know, sort of in a cartoon sketch here, if we think of all of quantum computations, then some of them can be classically simulated. And there are different techniques for simulating different kinds of quantum computations which are not compatible with each other. And so one question is, is there anything left over here, in fact? Can we classically simulate everything? Uh, well, we don't believe so, but, but it would be nice to learn more about how many of these patches there are and how much they cover. Um, but another interesting game we can play, which I guess I won't say too much about in these lectures, is, is given any such class of computations that can be classically simulated, um, what extra little bit of quantum resource can you add into that restricted class to regain universal quantum computing power? And, and that would be a candidate for for this elusive, um, you know, key quantum feature that lifts you from classical computing to full quantum computing. But rather um, worryingly, in that context, there are known examples where the extra resource is the most trivial things you can possibly imagine. So, so the whole power of quantum computing comes from essentially nothing, you know, from some of these points of view. So, so, so that's all sort of you know, it shows how complicated the, the relationship is. Um, okay, so, um, so let's move on now to some establishing some basic notions of circuits and complexity and so on, which I hope might be a bit familiar um, to many of you. And we've seen some already in, in other talks yesterday, I guess. Um, but we'll need to just establish a few basic definitions to set the stage for much of our you know, discussions. So, so some preliminaries. So we have a, a circuit. We'll be considering classical or quantum circuits. Incidentally, I, I don't really recommend that you try and write any of these down if, if you want to take notes or anything, but I'll provide all the slides on the web. But all the pages are numbered, and if you have any interesting insight or question about some particular thing, you might make a note of the number or, or write down some extra things if, if you're interested. So and that makes it a bit more manageable. Uh, okay, so circuits um, on n qubit lines or classical bit lines, classical or quantum circuits. This number n is very, it's probably the most important number that you can associate to a circuit. It's what we call the input size, you know, the, the number of lines. And then the circuit description is a prescribed sequence of some number of, say, one and two classical or quantum line gates, you know, one, 
two cubic gates or one cubic gate, say, um, capital N of them, and what the gates are and what lines they act on. And, and a second important parameter is the, the number of gates, capital N, which I'll write with this kind of bar sign here, that, that, which we think of as a number of time steps in the computation. Even if the gates can be done in parallel simultaneously, say on disjoint qubits, we still regard them as two time steps for these purposes here, um, at least for, for most of my talks. Um, so, and this number capital N will usually be tied to little n because for computations we, we will normally be interested in circuit families, that is a circuit for every input size n. When we come to, you know, the notion of computation will involve all different input sizes. So we have a so-called circuit family um, and we'll restrict how the number of time steps here, the circuit size, grows with the number of input lines here. Um, so, th actually there's a subtle technical remark here that the circuit model is usually regarded as being rather simple, but in fact it's one of the more messy um, models of computation if you want to be precise about it, mathematically precise, um, because there's this notion of uniformity of circuit families. So, if you have a circuit for every n, n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then um, if you're clever, you can sneak into the structure of the circuit some non-trivial information about n. You know, for example, um, there might be some property of the number n that's very, very hard to compute, a yes-no question about n, and you can just sneak in the one-bit answer to that question in a, in a particular part of the circuit, just put it in by hand. And that piece of information could be useful for solving other things much more easily. So, so you want to eliminate that possibility of cheating in, in the computing power of these circuits by this so-called uniformity condition, um, which intuitively is that the mapping given n to produce the description of the circuit from n, of the circuit Cn, it should be easy. It shouldn't take a lot of computing effort to do that. So um, it should be polynomial time computation, you know, sort of running classical polynomial time, or, um, or more precisely, it's, it's log space. But so, so actually, to, to, to properly explain this, this condition, it takes us you know, into a lot of unnecessary technicalities, which I don't want to do here. Um, but you should just be aware that there's an issue here and all the circuit families you've probably ever seen before are uniform in this sense. It, it very rarely um, is an issue in, in anything we consider, so I don't want to elaborate on this. But technically, the circuit model of computing doesn't live on its own. It actually has to rest on the Turing machine model in this sense or some other more primitive model, um, even though it's, it's easier conceptually to think about circuits than, than about Turing machines and other things. Uh, okay, so, so there we have circuits, and then the, um, we're, we'll often be considering poly, polynomial size circuit families, that is, as n grows, the size of the circuit grows as a, at most a polynomial function of n, rather than, say, exponential. And so, so the length of the description of the circuit remember that's, that's a list of the gates and the lines on which they act, is only polynomially long too. It's a polynomial function of, of the number of input lines, say the number of bits you need to describe the whole circuit. Uh, so it's actual description of the circuit, it's not the circuit itself that's running here. Um, so, you know, to, to specify a number from 1 up to n, the, the lines of action is only log n bits, right? So, to, to specify a number of size n. Um, and, you know, there are some various technicalities here as well. If, if the, so, let's just think of some finite set of gates that we're using, some discrete universal set, as we saw yesterday. So, then we don't have any real issues. But if the gates come from an infinite um, universal set, they might have continuous parameters and then it will always suffice for us to specify them to polynomial number of bits of precision, so everything stays polynomially sized here. And uniform circuit families always are polynomially sized in this sense, 
um, because of, of this, this uniformity condition here. Uh, if you can compute this quickly, you can't output a great big long, too long a description. So, so they're always examples of these things. And, and then for quantum computing, we'll need randomized classical computation. So we have probabilistic inputs, probabilistic um, choices. And so in addition to the input lines of the circuit, we model this by allowing some further input lines which at the beginning of the computation are set um, with probability a half to zero or one. So you just toss a bunch of fair coins and, um, and then run the circuit on, on the input you want together with these random bits. And so if you run the circuit a second time, the same computation a second time, these random bits are again independently set, so the output of the computation is, is probabilistic. So that's the way we model um, random choices in, in circuit model in a sort of formal sense. Um, so, okay, so then we have basic computational tasks and complexity classes, and again, hopefully a lot of this might be fairly familiar. If we introduce B sub N to be the set of all N bit strings, so there's two to the N of those, it's just a finite set, all strings of zeros and ones of length N. And then B star to be the set of all finite bit strings, the union of all the BNs. So that is an infinite set now of all finite bit strings. And a, a language, L, is just a subset of, of all these bit strings of different lengths. So for example, the language might be all those bit strings that are prime numbers in binary. So that's kind of a simple example of such a characterization of a language. And then associated to any language, we have the computational task, the decision problem, given any bit string, you, you need to decide whether it's in the given language or not. So it will be primality testing in, in this case here. And, and the computational process that we apply to any such given bit string is specified by one of our circuit families. So you take the circuit of the appropriate input size to match the length of, of the bit string. Um, so either it's a bit string or for quantum circuits, we'll take the associated computational basis state of that many qubits. Um, and, and the computational process is just to apply the circuit to that input. And the output you measure a specified line. That's part of the description of the circuit is to say, which line you measure at the end to get zero or one or, or yes or no, which is your answer. And the computation is called efficient or it runs in polynomial time if circuit sizes are polynomial in this sense that we've had. So that's um, like uniform circuit families always satisfy this condition. Um, okay, and so just a couple more preliminaries here. Um, so in terms of all those definitions, we have complexity classes. So formally, a complexity class is a set of languages, which you can think of as a set of decision problems, because associated to each language, you, you think of it as a problem of deciding whether you're in the language or not. Um, and, and then we have all these standard ones, which should be probably familiar. Classical P, which P stands for polynomial time. It's the set of all, or class of all languages that have uniform classical circuit families which decide membership with certainty. So if the input is in the language, the circuit will output one, and if the input's not in the language, it'll output zero. Okay, so that's deterministic classical polynomial time computation. And then we have probabilistic bounded error probabilistic polynomial time, so-called BPP. This is classical still. Um, so these are languages with classical randomized you know, circuit families with a, an extra boundedness condition on, on the probability that your answer is correct. So if the input was in the language, the probability that, that you get the right answer has to be bigger than two-thirds. And if it's not in it, again, the probability is bigger than two-thirds. So in all cases, the probability of the correct answer is bigger than two-thirds. Um, so the other probability is always less than one third. So, because you know the output probabilities are always just for zero and one. Um, so this is the origin of the term bounded here. 
um, it's bounded away from a half because there's a kind of there's daylight between a half and the two probabilities you can have. It's bigger than two thirds or less than, than one third. Um, and so this number two thirds here seems a bit arbitrary, but it's not hard to prove that the class of languages you get here is unchanged if you replace two thirds by any number, any other constant that's strictly bigger than a half and less than one. So you could put 0.5001 there, or you could put 0.9999999 there, and you'll get exactly the same class of, of, of languages. Um, and intuitively, the way that works is uh, you, um, if, if you've got 0.5, suppose you've got 0.6 here or something, you know, something less than two thirds, you, instead of just running the computation once, you run it several times, say a hundred times, and take the majority vote as your answer of all the answers. So, um, uh, so we'll see more of this later on, but it's perhaps good to elaborate a little bit here. I mean, in, in a simpler example, suppose you have a coin that's 0.6 heads and 0.4 tails for probability, and you're given this coin and you have to figure out which you don't know which is the one with the higher probability, which is in fact heads, but you have to determine which it is, and your life depends on it, right? If you give the wrong answer, you're immediately disposed of. So, well, of course, you toss the coin once, and you're more likely to get heads, but you'd probably be a bit nervous in, in giving that answer because, you know, it's not that unlikely that you get the wrong answer. So you think, ah, well, if I toss the coin a thousand times, that's just a constant, you know, a thousand times, I expect to get roughly 600 heads and 400 tails, and I, of course, I'm not going to get exactly 600 heads and 400 tails, but um, I don't expect to be too far off that. So surely it's very unlikely that the number of heads goes down below 500 from 600. So, so you do that, and then you give the answer, and you, you'll be much happier that, you know, much more confident that you'll stay alive, you know, for longer. And, and if you're still worried, then you toss it a million times, and, and, and sort of some larger number of times, and it's, and the probability that the majority vote is the correct one um, becomes very, very high, very quickly, exponentially, in the number of times you toss it. So similarly here, if you've got a, a computation that works correctly with probability 0.51 and you want, you want it to be correct with 0.99 probability, you simply run the computation 10 million times um, and take the majority vote as your answer and that will, you know, th there is a, a theorem, you know, Chernoff bound or law of large numbers which quantifies how many times you need to run it in order to make sure you get up to 0.99 or whatever. Um, and since each run of the computation is only a polynomial computation, if you run it a million times, it's a million times a polynomial time, which is still polynomial. So, so you're still run doing everything in polynomial time, so it's still efficient. So, so that's the idea here, that um, uh, we don't put any restriction on what this polynomial is allowed to be it's okay to bump it up to a higher degree polynomial, just as long as it stays polynomial. Uh, okay, so, so that's sort of the issue of that. And then in the quantum context, we have BQP, which is bounded error quantum polynomial time, whereas this one was classical polynomial time. And it's exactly the same thing, except now you have quantum circuits, but you have the same probability conditions on the correctness of the, the output. Uh, okay, so, so these are the most important basic classes and I'm not going to labour on defining NP and all sorts of other things like that, which we won't really need much of. So, you know, of course the main intuition here is that these classes, BPP and BQP, you think they're feasible in practice on classical or quantum computer. You know, we think of polynomial time as something you can reasonably do before you die, whereas an exponential time computation will not be finished, you know, um, in time for you to see what the answer is, even though it will finish eventually, it's computable. Uh, so, so we regard these as our mathematical models of, 
of what you are able to do in practice on a classical and quantum computer, and you allow a bit of probability of error because nothing ever works perfectly in the real world. So the class P is a somewhat of an unnatural idealization for actual implementations. And so it's easy it's to see that BPP is contained in BQP. These are just like quantum computations that never leave the computational basis state. You, you don't sort of have any non-trivial superpositions or anything ever occurring. Um, and the reverse question, well, um, so it's contained in there, but is it strictly contained? Is it possible that everything in BQP is already in BPP? So this is the issue of whether quantum computing is more powerful than classical computing in a, in a precise formulation, and, and no one knows that. We, we, people generally believe that it's strictly bigger, but, but we don't know for sure. Um, so so that's, that's kind of an interesting open question there to <laughs> try and solve. Um, so there, there are further kind of complications. General, I've only been talking about decision problems where the output is a single bit, a yes-no answer, but more general computations can have one more, you know, more than one bit of output, like given a number you want to find a factor of it, the factorization problem, there are several bits in the answer. So you can generalize much of what I've said, and I don't want to kind of labor all the definitions, otherwise we will never get to anything interesting. Um, so the notion of polynomial time and all that sort of stuff generalizes fairly naturally. Uh, okay, so those are our circuits, computations, complexity classes, polynomial time. So, um, so we come to the basic idea of what is a classical simulation of a quantum computation. And I'll give more precise definitions later um, before we start talking about Clifford computations because we don't really need them yet for this talk. But, um, but, but you do need to have a kind of a good intuitive idea of what we're talking about here. So the idea is that given a full description of a quantum computation with an input size n, so what that means, I call it capital D, you're given a description of the input, which you can always think of as a computational basis state, it's just an n-bit string if you like, and you're given a description of a quantum circuit that acts on n-qubit lines, so that just tells you what gates you apply in what order and to which qubit lines. And you're told which output lines are going to be measured. So that's a description of the computation. It's not, it's not running the computation itself. So notice that this whole description for a polynomial-sized computation um, is polynomial length as well in N because you know, to write down on a piece of paper a description of a polynomial-sized quantum circuit only takes a polynomial amount of lines of paper, if you like, to, to list all the gates and the lines on which they act, and then this extra supplementary information for the inputs and the outputs. So then a classical simulation, finally, then, is um, of that quantum... So, so that description defines a quantum computation uh, and a classical simulation of it is a classical computation, generally a randomized one, with the input to the classical computation is the description of the quantum computation. So this is slightly you know, tricky here. The, the whole description of the computation is now becoming the input to our computation, right? So we're not... And so the idea is that it's a classical computation which takes the description of the quantum computation as its input, and the output of the classical process can be several different things, depending on what we ask for. So as I think Ernesto briefly mentioned yesterday, there's this notion of strong and weak simulation, which I'll allude, to, you know, describe more later on, but we'll accept that the classical process, either it outputs a value of the probability, so suppose the computation was a, a, a decision problem with a yes-no output, so we want the, the classical process to either tell us what the probability of zero and one is, if it was a decision problem, so that's like strong simulation, or weak simulation is where you, you don't get the value of the probability, but, you, but the randomized classical computation outputs a sample by purely classical means 
from the same probability distribution or, or sufficiently close one that the quantum computation would have produced if it, if it ran itself as its output. So, in other words, the classical process, when it's applied to the description of this quantum process, it mimics the quantum process and outputs either you know, the same probabilistic stuff or else it, it gives you even more, it tells you the value of the probability. So, and the efficient simulation is, uh, simulation is called efficient or polynomial time if it runs in polynomial in the size of the description. So that's polynomial in little n as well, if the description was polynomial in, in, in little n, the number of lines of the original quantum computation. So quantum computations that have such an efficient simulation, classical simulation, are precisely the ones that do not offer computational benefit. They're things that, although you might like to implement them as a quantum circuit, you can just as well get the same answers out on a classical computer, given just a description of what the quantum process is supposed to be doing. Um, okay, so, right, so now let's move on to something a bit, bit more interesting and begin our discussion of entanglement here. So, um, everyone always says that you know, you have to have ent entanglement drives computational benefit, and you have to have it. So I'm going to prove for you that for pure state calculations, you need quite a lot of entanglement, or else you can be classically simulated and, and therefore not be useful. And then after that, I'll prove for you that universal quantum computing can be achieved with arbitrarily vanishingly small amounts of entanglement. So you don't really need any much entanglement. Um, and both of these results will be correct, and we believe mathematics is consistent, so um, then we'll see why, why these two things are not contradictory. And this is just one of the tips of the ice, many tips of the iceberg of why the question of the relation between entanglement and computing is so complicated and subtle. Because you can basically prove whatever you like if you just view it from the right angle. So, um, so first of all, the most simple argument of all is um, entanglement is necessary um, for a pure state comp computation if you're to get any computing benefit. Now, um, and, we'll, and this is very simple to see, uh, so, but the intuition here is even simpler and kind of underlies the whole thing very simply. It's simply the idea that if you have an entangled state of n qubits, to describe it, it's got exponentially many amplitudes, right? So, so it appears to have exponential, you know, you have to have exponential effort just to say what the state is. Now, if, if it was a product state and there was no entanglement, a, a one qubit state, you know, how much does that require? It's just, you know, two complex numbers for the two amplitudes, and as well there's the normalization condition, right? So, so if you've got n qubits and it's a product state, you, you only need like 2n complex numbers. It grows linearly and not exponentially. So, and, and it's this crucial difference between polynomial and exponential yeah, that... Uh, <laughs> right, okay. Gosh, and I thought quantum computing was hard. Yeah, so. <laughs> right, so is that right? So how does that look? <laughs> uh, right. Um, okay, so, so here's our very, very simple argument that entanglement is necessary. Um, so suppose you have a computation where at every stage the state is promised to be a product state when you apply gates, you don't actually entangle anything up, which is, you know, not impossible. It's rather restrictive, though. So, so here, here's a product state of n qubits, a, b, c, up to k, you know, for the qubits. 
and we suppose we apply a two qubit gate, one of the gates in our computation, to just the first two qubits, A and B, say. It could be any other two, but let's just do this one. And then the state you get um, will be some state, a psi, of the first two qubits, which would generally get entangled up, right? Um, in, in a proper computation. And in components, you can easily calculate the four amplitudes of this state given the two plus two of these. It's just a very simple constant sized calculation. And, and all the others, C up to K, just come along for a ride. They, nothing happens to them. But we're promised that this is a product state. So in fact, it's not entangled and it's A prime, B prime for some suitable qubit states here, and it's easy to see that given the four by four, you know, matrix of amplitudes of xi, you, you can do a little classical calculation to factorize it back into this form and identify what these things are and reinstate the description as just a pure product state. And so you can update this process from product state to product state with a constant amount of classical computation. It doesn't even grow with n because all the other qubits just come along for the ride. You're only looking at two qubits here, wherever they may be in, in the string. Um, so, so we have that. Um, so, so that's very, very simple. And, and just as simple is if you make a one qubit measurement. You know, if you've got a product state and you measure the third qubit, then you can easily work out the probability of zero and one because you just ignore all the other qubits and just look at that one qubit by itself. You know, it's very, very simple. It's just the amplitudes squared. So, um, so, so everything can be computed in constant, that, that can be computed in constant time too. So the whole process can be classically represented in linear time even, not even polynomial time. It's just the number of these steps that occur. Um, so, so therefore, no entanglement, no computing benefit, right? Anything the quantum process does, you can mimic classically in a very strong sense like this. Uh, so, but on the other hand, if the states are allowed to become entangled, th the argument doesn't work anymore. So, um, so here we have a general entangled state, and now you've got all these amplitudes. Before they were products, it was, you know, AI1, BI2, CI3, and so on. But here you've got a whole, just a general mess of exponentially many things. And when you update by our unitary gate on the first two, you, you have to do this calculation now. So here's the unitary gate acting on the first two qubits, and here are my new amplitudes. It's still a, a little two by, you know, four by four matrix calculation there, but the trouble is that now you have to repeat it for all the different values of I3 up to IN. They don't just come along for the ride anymore as they did in a product state. And there's two to the n over two of them. So there's exponentially many calculations you have to do. So suddenly the simple calculation that we did before in constant time now takes exponential time. So, so that method doesn't work for general entangled computations. Of course, some other method might work, but, but we don't know. No one's ever been able to figure one out yet. So, and probably no other method works in, in the most general case. Um, so, so that's very, very simple and shows that entanglement is necessary. Um, and um, so I want to move on now here to, to describe a very interesting generalization of this very, very simple argument to so-called matrix product states, um, which gives a much richer result and much more interesting, and it also gives us an excuse to talk about matrix product states, which are, are very important in many other areas, like, you know, in many body physics and study of ground states of local Hamiltonians and stuff like that. So, so what is a matrix product state? Well, we know what a product state is, you know, that's what we just had, and a matrix product state is where we simply replace the qubit slots, which were just qubit states in a product state with matrices of qubit states um, and multiply them together in a natural way. So instead of having A, B, C and so on, we have A, I, J, which is a matrix, you know, with I and J, the rows of columns, 
uh, of subnormalized states in general to make the whole thing normalized. So, so each slot is replaced by a matrix rather than a single state, and you multiply the matrices in the usual way. You know, I've left out all the tensor product symbols here. So the J and the J, you sum over all these things, and the K and the K, and so on. And, and you're left with the indices at the end, so you just deal with them in various ways. They're just a nuisance. So here I've just you know, um, made them equal and summed over them as well. Um, but it's perhaps neater and more common to replace the end states not by full matrices but by vectors, by one index things. And then you just, you know, you have the matrices multiplied here and, and you have a, a row vector and a column vector here. So, so, you know, pictorially it kind of looks like this where the dots are these one qubit states and you have a vector of states and a column vector of states, matrices of states, and you multiply all these together like that. Okay, so that's that's the definition of a matrix product state. I haven't said anything yet crucially about how big these matrices are allowed to be. Okay, so that's going to be an important thing. But before we come to that, um, there are other ways of describing these things. That's kind of a, a neat, compact way. You can make it look more technically demanding if you um, introduce components of everything. So, um, you know, if, if the A's... So th this is a... The, the, these are a bunch of vectors parameterized by J. So you write their components. So capital AJ superscript I1 is is the i oneth component, so i1 is 0 and 1, of, of the matrix of the state aj. And similarly, um, if you look at this expression here, it's just the, the component description of this matrix of states by looking at the matrix of the amplitudes, right? So it's just very simple. These just direct, you know, if you fix i and j, the state you get here is just the components of, of the thing you had here and all, all the way through. So you do that, and then this expression at the top obviously just comes down to this. I, I simply replace each of these guys by their, their kind of you know, component description, and, um, and then move all the i's out to the end, and now the amplitude here of, of a given computational basis of the whole lot is just a genuine matrix product of these matrices of complex numbers, um, you know, which define the individual matrices of these states here. So, so that's another way of viewing matrix product states. Uh, and then there's a, an even fancier thing you can do, um, which is where it can get really confusing, is that you can you can say, oh, well, here we've got matrices and we've got vectors at the end. You know, these guys at the end are just single index ones. Um, so since we're just doing somehow, you know, the amplitudes are determined by just this linear algebra operations. So I'm going to use Dirac notation for that as well as the quantum state. So, so I can write products of these matrices as just products of the corresponding capital letters here, and the A and the L, these vectors at the ends, are just a bra and a ket, you know, for these two things, for, for the components. And so equivalent, this is just a purely notational thing, is to write this complex number here as this Dirac expression. Um, so, but you have to be very careful here. These bras and kets are not physical quantum states. It's purely a notation for doing linear algebra. So here we have two different levels of linear algebra going on. We've got our genuine physical quantum mechanic kets, these I's, and then we've got this so-called internal space, or sometimes called the correlation space, um, which we can use the ket notation for as well, of operators and things like this. Um, and, and this is a fun thing to do because in measurement-based computing, um, which I'm not going to describe here, but I, other lectures will, um, one interesting way of viewing measurement-based computing is actually a, a process that occurs in the internal space. You can actually think of measurement-based computing as evolving these internal non-physical kets in a way that's determined by measurements applied to the physical um, qubits. So, so that's kind of interesting. Um, right, so, 
So we've got our matrix product states, and product states themselves are a special case of just one by one matrices. You know, if, if all these matrices are one by one, you're just back to the good old product state case. So it's a nice generalization. And another thing to note is that if the sizes of all our matrices are polynomial in the total number of qubits, then the whole matrix product state still has a poly size description. You know, if the, if the summation ranges of these, all of these indices is polynomial in the number of, of slots here. Um, but we know that general n qubit states depend on exponentially many parameters. So these special matrix product states, which have only poly sized matrices, um, are a very small part of the whole Hilbert space, yet they're physically extremely significant states. Nature seems to favor these things very much in, in most of what goes on in quantum many body physics. Um, so, um, but we know that we can't describe general uh, n-qubit states in this way. Uh, so this restriction on the sizes of these matrices is, well, first of all, by having a poly-sized description, just like for ordinary product states, we can hope for a classical simulation result involving these matrix product states now. And, and we do indeed get such a thing, which I'll describe next in a moment. But so this restriction on these matrix sizes to be only polynomially big is very usefully related to Schmidt rank of bipartite divisions of, of this n-qubit state or so-called log-depth poly-sized quantum circuits. So these very shallow depth quantum circuits. And uh, this sort of formalism was kind of realized by Guifre Vidal back in about 2003. And um, and there's a kind of more expository elementary account in something I wrote back in 2006, uh, which you can find on the archive, but um, I never published it anywhere, so it's just sitting there. Um, okay, so I want to describe some more things here, and, and it gives us a good excuse to start talking about Schmidt ranks and, and other such things, which are also very important in many areas of quantum computing, quantum information theory as well. So, so we heard a bit about this yesterday in um, Fernando's talk, I think, if I remember right. Um, so if you have a pure, um, so Schmidt rank and Schmidt bases and Schmidt coefficients are, are all defined in this way. Given any bipartite state, so uh, here we've just got two subsystems, they could be some number of qubits each, so just two subsystems, capital A and B. Uh, they can have dimensions M and N, just any two general dimensions. So here's the most general state, has these amplitudes, gamma i, j, M, N of them. And here are the basis states, uh, where the range is from 1 to M and, and 1 to N, for the, respectively. So the basic result here is that any such state can be written in this so-called Schmidt form, which is much simpler, it's, it's a single summation, not a double summation, of amplitudes which are always real and positive, so I write them as square root of lambda i, they're always real and positive, and furthermore, the states that occur here are orthonormal sets in, in the two spaces, so the alpha i's are orthonormal in system A, and the beta i's are orthonormal in, in system B. So, and furthermore, you don't get the cross terms. You don't get the ij terms, you only get the ii terms. That's the crucial thing about this Schmidt form, is that it's only a single summation, not a double summation, even though it's still a bipartite system. Uh, so, okay, and these sets of orthonormal vectors in the two systems, respectively, are called the Schmidt bases for the state. Uh, so, so this is a fact of linear algebra again, I guess. Um, uh, uh, it's easy to prove if you just look up some books on linear algebra. The, the, the slickest, quickest proof is to just quote the so-called singular value decomposition of any matrix. So in linear algebra, given any m by n matrix, like the matrix of amplitudes here, the singular value decomposition theorem asserts that any matrix at all 
can be written as U, D, V, where U and V are unitary, and so this is M by N, it doesn't have to be square, but the U and the V are M by M and N by N to match the size of, of the C, and this D in the middle is trying its hardest to be a real diagonal matrix. So you need a matrix of size M by N, the rectangular size of the one you started with, and D just has non-zero entries down its diagonal, which may hit the bottom before you, you know, get to the right corner, or it may hit the side if it's rectangular the other way up, and they may not all be non-zero, some of them could be zero along there. So it's as close as you can get to a diagonal matrix in a rectangular array. And, and they're all positive real numbers on here. Um, so that's what the singular value decomposition asserts. It's, it's a kind of generalization of, you know, familiar diagonalization of Hermitian matrices or whatever. So, but this is completely general for any matrix whatsoever. Um, so if we apply the singular value decomposition to the matrix C of amplitudes in this bipartite state, so here I've simply plugged in the, the UDV expression, UIK is unitary, VLJ is unitary, um, and this is diagonal. So if we now move the, the I and the J sums inside and keep the K and the L sums outside, so here's the I sum, the U's hitting the I's, and the J sum is the V's hitting the J's, so you get that and that, and here we have our diagonal real things and, and the chronic are delta because you get zeros off the diagonal. And since the i's and the j's were orthonormal, when you hit them with a unitary matrix, they're still orthonormal. So you just rotate the basis. So these are my Schmidt bases now. I simply call these the alpha, the alpha k's and the beta l's. So the alphas and the betas that go here. And you, you, don't, you only get the k equals l contribution you don't get the cross terms for different I and I's in here because this thing is, has zeros off the diagonal here. It's this delta function here. So this, this is a complete proof of the, the Schmidt theorem based on this non-trivial result of linear algebra. Okay, so, so you have that. Um, so it immediately follows that uh, the reduced states, so, so it's, it's easy to compute the reduced states now, you see, because if you've got the state written in this Schmidt form, so if you imagine tracing over, say, the second subsystem, since the betas are, are all orthonormal, you, you only get the terms, you know, if you have this and it's, it's bra the other way around, you only get the terms where the i's match the, the betas here, and so you get something diagonal in the alphas with lambda squared being the... Uh, the diagonal entry. So, so what that means is that both reduced states, they both have rank R, the number of non-zero eigenvalues, um, which is the dimension of their supports, and the Schmidt bases are the eigenbases of these reduced states. And furthermore, the squared Schmidt coefficients are the eigenvalues of these reduced states. Um, so, so it gives a good kind of interpretation of what these Schmidt coefficients and Schmidt bases are, they're, they're nothing more than the, the eigenbases of the reduced states and the eigenvalues of the reduced states, the squared Schmidt coefficients. Uh, so, so these reduced states always have the same eigenvalues if they come from, from a, a pure bipartite state. Uh, and if, if you started with a product state, that happens if and only if the Schmidt rank is one. Uh, so, you know, obviously here, this is already written in its Schmidt form because A by itself is an orthonormal set in system A and B by itself is an orthonormal. There's nothing to be orthogonal to, you know. So, so this is the simplest possible Schmidt form you can have. So, um, and... Uh, so the Schmidt coefficients are unique given the state phi AB and the Schmidt bases are unique too if the Schmidt coefficients are, are all different. That, that easily follows from the fact that they are just 
the, the data relating to the reduced states, which are uniquely determined by, by the starting state. Um, okay, so, so that's our little digression about what Schmidt rank and Schmidt bases are. So, so now if we go back to matrix product states, uh, so you know, I mentioned that the polynomially sized matrices can't capture all n qubit states, and you may wonder, well, you know, um, oh. uh, this this matrix products form here, uh, it's not obvious that every state can even be written like this. Maybe I mean. Is it really true that every n qubit state can be expressed in, in this form for suitable matrices? Uh, well, it can be. Every, every n qubit state uh, is a matrix product state, but the caveat here is possibly exponential sized matrices are needed. And furthermore, the Schmidt ranks for, for any bipartition of this n qubit state. Uh, is directly related to the uh, to the range of the summation of the indices at that point, to the size of the matrix at that point. So you can see that like this. So this is roughly how this arises. Um, to prove that any state on n qubits uh, you know, can be written as a matrix product state, here's a, an explicit recipe for how to do that. So, so you look at your n qubit state, and you first look at the partition for the first qubit versus all the other qubits. Then you write that bipartite split in its Schmidt form. So here, I've written it like this. Um, I've absorbed the Schmidt coefficients into the orthonormal basis A here. So, and I've put a twiddle on here to indicate that. Okay, so it's just neater not to have to write them all out. So here, here's the Schmidt form. So, so these guys are orthogonal, and so are these guys in the whole rest of the space. And that must exist, because by the Schmidt theorem. Now, now I'm going to look at all of these guys, the excise, for 2 up to n. And I simply iterate this. I look at the split 2 versus 3 up to n. And I do the same thing. I look at the Schmidt form of that decomposition for every j. So for each xi j, I get its Schmidt form. So this j index I'll now call k. So the jth one of these has a new index for its Schmidt form like this. And then, then each one of these eaters also has a Schmidt form for 3 versus 4 up to n. And, and you keep on iterating this. And, and you see the expression you're developing is, is an expression of this form, which is precisely of the form of matrix product state. So, so this little argument here uh, shows that any n qubit state can certainly be written as a matrix product state. And furthermore, the, the range of the indices, the, the, the size of these matrices, that is, the, the range of these summations, is directly related to the Schmidt ranks that occur at these partitions in, in the state. Um, and going the other way, um, conversely, uh, any matrix product state, uh, you know, like this, if we if we draw a line for a bipartition, so qubits 1 up to i and i plus 1 up to n, um, then if we do, we can write it as just a bipartite sum like this, where the a's and the b's are the summations over 1 up to i and i plus 1 to n. So, uh, so we leave, well, um, uh, so, so we, we, we leave out the M summation and put all the other summations inside here. And that, that gives these capital AMs and BMs for each M. And then the whole matrix product state is just the sum over M of these. So, so here we have the expressions. And, and we can easily see that the rank of the reduced states now is um, less than the range of the summation for M. Because when you form the reduced state, you get a linear combination, um, so, or, or more directly, the support of, say, the reduced state on, on the first subsystem here is spanned by, by these vectors, um, so, which is quite easy to see. So the Schmidt rank, um, again, is less than or equal to the range of the corresponding 
uh, summation index in the matrix product state. So, so in other words, the you know the, the key message here is that this, the size of these matrices in a matrix product state is directly related to the Schmidt rank at, at those um, at the, that stage. Um, right. So. Uh, Okay, so, so now let's come back to our um, classical simulation ideas. So um, we had that very simple argument that if we just have ordinary product states, not matrix product states, but ordinary ones, then we can classically simulate it because we can easily compute the update of a two qubit gate or a measurement on a single qubit. And the point now is that the same argument actually generalizes quite straightforwardly to matrix product states in a way that complicates only insofar as, as how big the matrices are, the, the actual sizes of the matrices. So, um, so if I've got a matrix product state and the size of all the matrices is bounded by some number R, say, you know, which may or may not be polynomial in N or whatever, um, then if you apply a single qubit gate to that matrix product state, or a two qubit gate to any two qubits of it, or a single qubit is measured, then you can compute the matrix product state description of the updated state, the final state you get out of this, um, or, or the post-measurement state after the measurement, and the probabilities, all of those things can be computed, uh, actually I left out the crucial thing here, in time that's polynomial in R. So, so remember R was just one for ordinary product states, they were just one by one matrices, and you could do it in, in just constant time there. But now, if you, if you write all this out, which is rather dull and, and sort of just technical, you, and look at it, you see that all you really are doing is the same kind of calculations you did for a single state, but now you have to repeat it for all choices of, of the pairs of states out of the two matrices. So you have to repeat it, you know, some polynomial number of times in R, times a constant, and so therefore it's still all polynomial in R. So the upshot of all that is, and I'm not writing all the details down here, is that if, if you have a poly-sized quantum circuit, a polynomial number of such steps, and the input state and the state at every stage is a matrix product state with um, matrices of only polynomial size rather than exponential size, then you can still classically efficiently simulate the whole thing as a kind of generalization of the very simple argument for, for matrix product states, for, for, for ordinary product states. Um, okay, so I just want to say a little bit more about that. Um, so the, so I want to look slightly more closely at these three actions of, um, of these, you know, one qubit gates or two qubit gates or, or measurements on a matrix product state and to say what, what effect it has on the Schmidt ranks for any cut. So suppose you have a matrix product state and you divide the qubits into the some first number and all the rest of them, A, cut, and B, as we've been doing. Then if you apply a one qubit gate, and suppose the Schmidt rank is R for this cut, then if you apply a one qubit gate anywhere in here, the Schmidt rank doesn't change across there. Um, if you apply a two qubit gate, um, if, if the two qubits occur both in A or both in B, again the Schmidt rank doesn't change. But if the two qubit gate straddles these two things, one of the qubits is in A and the other one's in B, then the Schmidt rank changes, but it can only go up at most by a factor of four. So R primed is, is, is at most 4R. And, and if you do a measurement on one of these qubits, the Schmidt rank can only decrease. You, can, you can't enhance the Schmidt rank by measurements. So, so this is perhaps the most interesting part here. The other ones are quite easy to see if you kind of write down all the ingredients here. Um, to see that the Schmidt rank can't go up by more than a factor of four, and in fact it's tight, you can have it going up by a full factor of four here. Um, so, so first of all, 
um, if you have a poly size circuit, the, the constraint that the, the matrix product states have matrices only of polynomial size is therefore a non-trivial restriction because if you apply, apply these two cubic gates over and over again, each time you can get another factor of four. So with, with n, a linear number of two cubic gates, the Schmidt rank can go up to exponentially large in n, which is no longer polynomial. So, um, so, so it is a non-trivial restriction to require that this doesn't happen in your poly-sized quantum circuit. Um, so, so to see where this factor of four comes from, um, I guess you, you look at the, the split here at A and B with, with this index M with qubit I and qubit I plus one, and for each value of L, M, and N of these two matrices, you just have an ordinary product state here. So if you think, if you look at that ordinary product state of just D, L, M, and E, M, N for those fixed values of L, M, and N, uh, the application of, of the two qubit gate just gives you a new two qubit state here which is no longer a product state necessarily. It's a general entangled state, but that is only a two qubit state, so it has Schmidt rank at most four. Two qubit states can never have Schmidt rank bigger than the dimension of the subsystem, so it's, it's four there. Um, so, um, so in other words, this product state gets replaced by, by this two qubit state, which is entangled, and you write it in its Schmidt form like this with its four terms, and, and this extra index we've got for summing the new Schmidt coefficients, which used to be one in the product state, and now it's gone up to possibly four, um, just gets tacked on to the M summation, which gets multiplied up by a factor of four, because this happens for each possible choice of M. Uh, okay, so may maybe this is probably a bit hard to take in if you haven't sort of seen this before, but, um, but if you look at it more slowly, it's quite easy to see where, where all these, these rules come from. Um, so, so let me not kind of labor that point anymore. So, so basically, um, the moral out of all this is that um, if, if you have a polynomial-sized quantum circuit and the state at every stage is a matrix product state with poly-sized matrices, not just one by one matrices, which is ordinary product states, but poly-sized, then it can still be classically efficiently simulated. Um, so, um, just very briefly now, a relation to um, log depth circuits. So, so what is a log depth circuit? Um, a, a log depth circuit is one that's very shallow in a particular sense. So, it's a circuit of gates, and here I've schematically drawn some two qubit gates with blobs and lines on some qubit lines here. Um, it's, it's a circuit that can be divided up into layers, which I've drawn with these vertical lines here, and there's only order log n, logarithmically many in the total number of lines of these layers. So it's very shallow in that sense. It's kind of exponentially shallow because a polynomially sized circuit can go on for polynomially many gates. But the point is here that all the gates in every one of these layers should be applicable simultaneously. In other words, in each one of these layers, uh, each qubit line is used at most once. Like here, for example, although I've got three gates, they all act on different qubit lines. No qubit is used twice, so I can parallelize them all. I can do them all kind of simultaneously physically. And similarly here, and similarly here. Uh, but uh, this gate here, for example, I could move back to here and then move right back to the beginning because it doesn't kind of affect these gates. It commutes with them because it's on different qubits. And I could even move it back into the previous layer, but then I shouldn't do that because this qubit then is used twice. So, so I can't move this guy back in, into here and so on. So it's a kind of slightly tricky constraint. But you know there are such circuits that, that have um, uh, this sort of shallow depth structure. 
So, so now suppose you have that, and now suppose the input is a product state, as we often have, like a computational basis state, and suppose in our circuit all the two qubit gates have a constant range, which is kind of physically a natural condition, which is not always applied in the circuit model. So, you know, like your controlled NOT gate or whatever, um, physically, you know, to apply that to qubit 1 and n is, is a non-trivial thing as n grows because the qubits get further apart. So suppose I insist that in my circuit all two qubit gates are only allowed to be applied to gates at most 10 lines apart or some constant number of lines apart. Um, then for any split, um, for any bipartition, there can be at most C gates, at most C qubit gates can straddle these two things in any one of these layers because, um, you know, at most C of the lines above can be used if you're only allowed to use them once. Um, so, so, um, so in any layer, uh, uh, you can have at most a constant number of these two qubit gates. So, and since we've got logarithmically many layers in the whole circuit at most logarithmically many two qubit gates are ever allowed to, to cross over these things. But now remember that um, the Schmidt ranks can go up by a factor of four each time. And that's a problem if you've got like n of them, you get four to the n, exponential size. But if you've only got logarithmically many of them, as must be the case for circuits of two qubit gates of constant range um, in a log depth circuit, the Schmidt rank can only go up by four multiplied together logarithmically many times, and four to the constant log n is polynomial in n. You know, exponential of log is polynomial. So, in other words, any such process is classically efficiently simulatable. Um, so, so, in other words, any log depth quantum circuit of bounded range two qubit gates is classically efficiently simulatable and offers no computing benefit. Um, so, uh, which is a surprising result, you know, to because to, you can get rather complicated looking circuits. And, and in fact, this argument fails if if the circuits are allowed to act at arbitrary range, you, know, you might say, what is all this business about constant range? Well, the, the key issue was that only constantly many gates are then allowed in each layer. But if, if you're allowed arbitrary range gates, so here's, here, for example, I've got n qubits and I've split them in the middle into a and b, and I've got these two qubit gates, one to n over two, two to the next one, three to the next one, all the way down to here. So there's about n over two of these gates can now all straddle this line, and now you can have four to the n over two, so it can become exponential, and the previous argument fails. So the Schmidt rank can go way up. And, and this is a very interesting observation because uh, Cleve and Watros showed that you can actually implement the quantum Fourier transform on n qubit lines with a log depth circuit of, but the log depth circuit uses gates of this sort. It, it can't be done in log depth with only constant range gates. Um, so if, if such a log depth circuit were classically simulatable, then Shaw's algorithm would be totally classically simulatable too. So from this point of view, the whole computational benefit of Shaw's algorithm arises entirely from the fact that these two qubit gates are al allowed to act at great distances rather than constant range, which seems like a kind of trivial constraint because in order to um, reduce arbitrary range to constant range, you can do it by just putting swap gates in between. So, so another way of saying this is that the entire power of Shaw's algorithm rests entirely on swap gates um, and spoiling a log depth circuit, um, which is sort of slightly surprising and perhaps a bit provocative. So, 
Okay, so that's a rather long digression, which took a bit longer than I intended. Um, how much longer should I go for? Another uh, 15 minutes or 15? Okay, I'll, well, um, let me see what I can get through here. Um, so, 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 okay, so, so now drawing a line under all that, um, the Schmidt rank of a bipartite state is often regarded as an entanglement measure. The number of non-zero coefficients is a kind of measure of entanglement between A and B. It can be as large as the, the smaller of the two dimensions. It can never be bigger than the dimension of A, a or B because these are orthonormal sets within those subsystems, these Schmidt bases. So for, for n qubit states, um, you know, the Schmidt rank is generally order 2 to the n, which is like the dimension of n over 2 qubits, say, um, for, for generic n qubit states. Um, so, so our whole argument so far is from this point of view, to get computational benefit, we need a large entanglement in, in this sense. So if we regard the Schmidt rank as an entanglement measure, we need more than polynomially growing large amount of entanglement with n in order to get computational benefit, because if we only have polynomially increasing entanglement from this measure, then we can always classically simulate it. So it would appear that we have a cast iron result here that you need more and more entanglement in order to um, get any computational benefit. And it has to grow rather strongly, more than any polynomial. Um, but now we can also show that universal quantum computing can also be achieved by quantum processes with arbitrarily little entanglement in, in apparent contrast to this. And this was a, a nice result of Martin van der Nest a few years back, and here's the archive paper. So, so the key to this is to use a different entanglement measure, and, and that's, that's ultimately how the, the apparent contradiction will be resolved. Um, so, so this has also been mentioned, I think, yesterday. So the entanglement entropy is probably the most popular and most useful measure of entanglement. Uh, the Schmidt rank is not so useful, but it's rather simpler in many contexts. Um, so here we have a bipartite state, and we have the reduced states, as always, row A and row B of a pure bipartite state. We're, we're, th this will work for mixed states too, but, but here we're just considering pure ones. And the entangle, so the Schmidt rank is simply the, the number of non-zero eigenvalues of these guys, whereas the entanglement entropy is not the number of non-zero eigenvalues, it's the Shannon entropy of those eigenvalues. It's simply the entropy of the squared Schmidt coefficients, which are the, the eigenvalues of the, both reduced states using the usual Shannon entropy form. So it's the von Neumann entropy, if you like, of, of the reduced states. So for a pure product state, it's easy to see that you know the Schmidt coefficients are just one and all zeros. So, so the entanglement entropy is zero two. And for a maximally entangled state in D dimensions, which is this state here, uh, all the Schmidt coefficients are the same. It has very high, it has the highest possible Schmidt entanglement characterization, but also it has the highest possible entanglement entropy of log d. That's the biggest this, this function can be for d, d values of the x's here. Um, so, okay, so, so the issue now is, suppose we have any poly-sized circuit that solves a BQP problem. So this is our notion of feasible quantum computation. So the probability that the output is correct is always at least two-thirds, which means, as we mentioned already, the output probabilities for both zero and one are always bigger than two-thirds or less than one-third. And the trick is to figure out which of the two probabilities is bigger than two-thirds, because that's your answer. That's what you're after, right? So that's, that's the one you want. So in other words, to determine what the correct answer to the problem is, it suffices to know what the probability of, say, zero is to an accuracy of one-sixth, because a one-sixth you know, kind of sleeve uh, additive error around two-thirds and one-thirds don't overlap. So, so it'll either take you up to a half or down to a half, but not overlap. And if you know this probability to just that accuracy, 
then that's enough to know whether it's really the two-thirds one or the one-thirds one. Okay, and so we'll now describe how we can actually determine this um, with arbitrarily little entanglement and still polynomial effort and hence solve anything in BQP with as small entanglement entropy as you want um, and vanishingly small even as n gets larger and larger. Um, and the way we do this is as follows. So um, suppose the circuit, you know, our BQP circuit is on n qubit lines as usual and let's just suppose the input is all zeros for simplicity. If you have other inputs, it's just the argument will be very similar, so let's not bother with that. Um, and so, so what we do are, the, are these things. So we introduce one extra qubit to our n, so we've got n plus one of them now, with, and with a single gate we rotate it round to this state. We leave it mostly in zero and and introduce a little bit of one amplitude. Epsilon's going to be small to be fixed later, okay? So just think of epsilon as being very small. So the input state now is all the zeros for the circuit together with this extra qubit which has got this zero and one bit to it. So it's just that, okay? That's there's the n plus one qubits. Now, instead of applying my original quantum circuit on n qubits, I'm going to replace every gate of that circuit by its controlled version, controlled by my new qubit. So if the new qubit was in state zero, nothing will be applied to the other qubits, but if it's in state one, the actual gate will then be applied. That's the usual controlled construction. So now I used to have two qubit gates and now they've been controlled, so I've got three qubit gates. Now you can just live with that, that's okay. Or if you really like your two qubit gates, since you were working with a universal set of two qubit gates, you, might, you could always just re-express these two, three qubit gates back in terms of a nice little constant sub-circuit of two qubit gates represent them. So either way, you know, it's, there's no real overhead in the size of the circuit, it's just a constant overhead. So, okay, so now suppose we do all that, and now let's consider what happens if we apply the first T gates. So C sub T is the unitary action uh, up to step T of my original quantum circuit, the first T gates. Well, if, if we apply it now, then you know, here, nothing's going to happen. So since everything's controlled by zero, this will just stay at zeros. But the one that's at one, the, the gates will be applied here. So we will, get, we will get the state of my original circuit just sitting here, but not here. So, so roughly speaking, I'm, 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 a, I'm running my actual original circuit, but only with amplitude of psilon in this sense. So we get a state of this form, all zeros plus a little bit of some n qubit state alpha, I've just called it alpha here, and the one just stays there for the ride, the new qubit. And alpha is in fact the n qubit state you would get in your original circuit after T gates. Okay, so it's very straightforward construction. So finally, out of these n plus one qubits, so you do this all the way through your original circuit, and you measure the output qubit of your original circuit, the one that should have given you the answer in your original circuit. So suppose the probability is P. So remember, this is the guy that's either two-thirds or you know, bigger than two-thirds or less than one-third for the original circuit. So let's look at probability of one rather than probability of zero. Then, but, but I'm not running the original circuit, I'm doing this funny trick of only running it with low amplitude. So what would, what's the probability of getting one out of this state? Well, I'm never gonna see one in this first bit because nothing's happened, everything stays at zero, and the only place I see the one is in here, but this only happens with a psilon amplitude or a psilon squared probability, so it's obvious that in this extended circuit, the probability of seeing one is not just P, but it's P that happens only epsilon squared of the time. So it's epsilon squared times P, which is rather smaller because epsilon's small, right? So, so that's the crux of it. So, so now, suppose we can estimate Q. So, so now I'm interested in, um, oops, I've gone 
Wrong way. So suppose I can estimate this Q to accuracy order of psilon squared. Then I can, that will enable me to determine the first few digits of P. And that will therefore enable me to solve my problem because then I can tell whether it's big, bigger than two thirds or, or nearer to zero, less than one third. So, so the whole crux now is how do I estimate Q to accuracy of psilon squared uh, in sort of polynomial effort, because that will solve my problem for me. And later, in fact, we'll take a psilon to be reciprocal polynomial. So it gets smaller and smaller even as n gets bigger and bigger. So to obtain this estimate, we, we use this thing I mentioned near the beginning, the so-called chernoff hefting bound, or law of large numbers. And intuitively, this is nothing more than a means of estimating probabilities via frequencies of repeated samplings of a distribution. So more generally, estimating the expectation value of a random variable by sampling it and just averaging all the answers you get. Um, so so it, the average of repeated independent samplings, say capital K of them. So if the random variable has values zero and one, like we have in our quantum measurements, then the expectation value is just the probability of one. Right, so it relates directly to this. So, so here's the theorem, the chernoff hefting theorem or law of large numbers or whatever, a classical basic probability or statistics. Um, if a random variable is bounded in plus and minus one, so I don't want to worry about its variance getting big, so, um, so that, that just keeps it, make sure its variance is less than one. Then if I do K samplings, so, so this random variable has a, a genuine expectation value, which, which we want to try and estimate. And we've sampled at k times, and we've taken the average of those. So that's going to be an estimate of this. And the question is, how good is that estimate? So f note, first of all, that expectation value of x is just some number, whereas this guy here is not just a number, it's a random variable, because if I do it another k times and do this, I'll get different answers and I'll get a slightly different answer here. So, so it's not a question of how close this is, but it's a question of how close this is with what probability. So the theorem says the following. Suppose I want eta additive error, and I want that with good high probability. So how many times do I need to sample it to guarantee that? And that's what this, this theorem tells me. The probability that K samplings averaged gives me a good eta approximation to this number I want is at least one minus this exponential expression here. So it's exponential. Um, so this is the failure probability, this one, one minus that is a success, so this little thing on the end is a failure. So it fails with a probability that grows exponentially, it's e or rather decays exponentially with eta squared and the number of samplings. So, so if I want, say, eta to be one-sixth or one-tenth or some, something like that, that, that we do in our case to distinguish one-thirds and two-thirds, um, then if we have a kind of fixed eta there, the bigger and bigger k is means that the probability that I'll get my good estimate, um, I'll get it with exponentially better and better probabilities as k gets bigger and bigger because it's a minus k here. And indeed, um, I can get very high success probability if k is essentially order 1 over eta squared to, to, to keep this thing down to... A, to um, to, to make this like a large constant in a negative exponent here. Um, so, so, so 1 over eta squared order that sampling suffice to get an eta estimate with any high probability. Um, so actually I should, I guess, sort of quickly wind up here. So, um, so, so back to our quantum circuit, um, if we take... Um, e so remember, we're, we're trying to get this epsilon squared accuracy for, for this probability Q. Uh, so it suffices to, to do... Um, uh, oops, I've gone too far there, Rick. So here, we want this epsilon squared accuracy, uh, and that will solve our problem for us. So... Um, 
So if I take a psilon to be a reciprocal polynomial, so this is, um, uh, you know, sort of the amount of the amplitude of actually running the quantum circuit, uh, we can determine if the probability of one is bigger than two thirds or less than one third with any fixed high probability, say 0 0.99999, with order one over eta squared, which is still polynomial, because squares of polynomials are polynomial, square roots or whatever, so still in polynomial time by running the quantum process, a poly, a poly time quantum circuit run polynomially many times is still polynomial, the whole thing, because products of polynomials are polynomial. And furthermore, all the quantum states in the whole process uh, have, have this form that we saw, where this epsilon is this parameter now. And remember, this was the actual evolving state of the, the original circuit, but epsilon is reciprocal polynomially sized. And so therefore, computations quantum computations, polytime quantum computations involving only states of this form suffice to efficiently solve any problem in BQP. And now we can argue that states of this form have, must have very low entanglement entropy. Um, and perhaps, so I'll, I'll stop here in a minute rather than going to how this works. So we argue that these states for any bipartition have um, very low entanglement entropy. So, so the idea is, is the following. So if you consider any state of this form, uh, if you imagine, so, so, so you notice that for small epsilon, this state is very, very close to just being all zeros, because it's all zeros plus a tiny amplitude of something complicated. So, so you, and since the entanglement entropy is defined to be the Shannon entropy of the, you know, or the von Neumann entropy of the reduced states and all that, which is a continuous function of the quantum states, um, the entanglement entropy for any bipartition of a state like this is going to look like, be very close to the entanglement entropy of this, just this state of all zeros. But that entanglement entropy is zero. So, so when you tweak the epsilon up a little bit, the entanglement entropy is only going to be tweaked a little bit from zero and hence stay small. Um, and you can formalize that argument, which I, I won't go through the formalization because I guess I've sort of run out of time. Um, but uh, you can formalize that by actually deriving explicit uh, expressions as, as how much does the entanglement entropy actually increase as a function of epsilon when epsilon starts increasing up from zero. You can get explicit bounds on that and then prove ex explicitly here this result about um, uh, quantum computations all being solvable by processes involving states that have arbitrarily little entanglement. Uh, whereas before we we had arbitrarily large um, Schmidt rank as needed in, in, in terms of this polynomially growing size. So um, I guess we're sort of run out of time. Should I stop there, I suppose? Um, uh, actually, I'll, I won't go through this, but uh, just to finish this off, I, I, I suppose you know, I should say what's the resolution of the apparent contradiction between these two things. So, so let me, I mean, if you want to read my slides on the web or something, because I probably won't go through this next time, has, um, to, to do this comparison of entanglement you know, um, measure how it changes with epsilon, we, we use some interesting techniques from quantum information theory, Fanis inequality, which gives you a measure of how much the entropy of a quantum state changes if you tweak the state a little bit, like with this epsilon, and so on, and that turns out to be a very useful tool here. Uh, okay, so, so, so the apparent contradiction here is that the, uh, the entanglement entropy can be arbitrarily small, but the Schmidt rank entropy has to be arbitrarily large. So, so we've got these two measures of entanglement, and you think, well, you know, entanglement is entanglement, so what's going on here? Um, 
So, so perhaps um, rather than going through this slide, uh, uh, the, the issue is, I'll just write it up here perhaps. Um, is, is there a light for this? Uh, So, so the point is that whereas entanglement entropy is a continuous function, if you tweak the state a little bit, the entanglement entropies change a little bit, but the Schmidt rank is not continuous. So, so you know, often when you hear the word, you know, is something rather continuous, you think, oh, that's theoreticians talking about subtle, pure mathematics, you know, physicists don't care about that. But here, it's absolutely crucial. So suppose I have a state phi AB, and you have the reduced states, um, rho A and rho B, then um, the Schmidt rank of the you know, bipartition is, is the number of non-zero eigenvalues, whereas the, the entanglement entropy is is the Shannon entropy of the, of the non-zero eigenvalues. Okay, so these are two different things. Now, so consider, so suppose, suppose the non-zero eigenvalues, suppose lambda one is, uh, is the square root of, or so the eigenvalues are the squares of the Schmidt coefficient, so one minus epsilon squared, and the others, and lambda two, and all the others up to lambda, say, capital D of them, or say, little d of them, are uh, epsilon over the square root of, so epsilon over, sorry, epsilon squared over d minus one. Okay, so, so there are d minus one of these. Okay, so, so you can have a, a state in d, d by d dimensions where the first eigenvalue is almost one and, and all the others are equal and very small but non-zero. So there are explicit such states. So suppose I consider the state phi AB, which is um, square root of one minus epsilon squared zero, zero AB plus in D dimensions, some I equals one, not zero, up to D minus one of um, I, I, a, B, and here we put um, epsilon over the square root of D minus one. Okay, so this is a, a good normalized state. Uh, you know, and, and these are the squared um, amplitudes, they add up to one. Uh, zero and the I's are all orthonormal, so this is the Schmidt form you're looking at here, right? This is the Schmidt form. And the Schmidt coefficients are these coefficients here, and, and the lambdas are precisely these. But now you see that as epsilon tends to zero, uh, the h of one minus epsilon squared and d minus one of epsilon over epsilon squared over d minus one. So the Shannon entropy of these guys will tend to h of one and on all zeros, which is zero. It just happily um, co continuously converges to zero. But what about the Schmidt rank? Well, the Schmidt rank stays non-zero all the way down to epsilon equals zero because um, they're non-zero, although they're small. So the Schmidt rank stays full d all the way down, but when you hit epsilon equals zero, the Schmidt rank suddenly drops from D all the way down to one in one hit. So it's discontinuous. So, you know, so in other words, if you have, say, epsilon here, and so the Schmidt rank um, is zero there, and it's D up there, so the Schmidt rank does that. Whereas the entanglement entropy, um, it sort of starts at at log of d, I guess, a and then just happily converges down to zero continuously. Um, so, so what we're doing here is we're operating with states very near here. So they have a big Schmidt rank, but a, but a small entanglement entropy. And that's sort of the resolution of that contradiction. So 
So you even have to be very careful to say what you mean by entanglement or how you measure it, you know, because there's zillions of other entanglement measures as well. Uh, okay, so um, perhaps that's a good point to stop for today. Um, uh, there were a couple of other things I was going to say, but maybe I can postpone them till, till next time. Uh, okay, good. Well, thanks for your attention. <coughs> So we are a bit later than we expected. So we are thinking of reconvening maybe at half past two instead of two. Okay. So maybe then we still have time for a, a, a couple of questions if anyone is interested. Um, well, the Schmidt rank, it is zero at a epsilon equals zero, but it doesn't tend to zero, right? So, so each entanglement measure has to be examined on its own merits, and it depends on how it's defined. It may or may not. Uh, no, that when you say it hasn't got any entanglement, that doesn't make any sense. It's not doesn't mean anything until you say what entanglement is measured by. So, so yeah, but I mean, in a very real physical sense, these this the entanglement entropy is much more sensible than than Schmidt rank, right? So as a measure, because these states really do have low entanglement in a natural physical sense. Um, uh, so I think um, most people would view it that way. So, so entanglement is not needed for quantum computing power in this sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, if, if epsilon is not just one over poly n, but one over it, it shrinks exponentially, one over you know two to the n or something, then this argument doesn't work because if you look in the Chernoff Hefting thing, that the number of samplings you need to get there, you know, when the eta there becomes ex exponentially small too, is um, is exponential number, so. If you're going to use this method, it won't work. It will incur an exponential overhead, and indeed, we don't believe such quantum computations, uh, you know, can be. Um, well, well, if um, sorry, if if the entanglement shrinks exponentially, um, uh, they, sorry, then you can simulate those. I guess. Uh, yeah. Yes. So yeah. Um, Uh, no, it should come out of this, I think. Um, um, oh, no, sorry, sorry, no. Um, uh, no, no, sorry, it's... Here we're trying to use... With exponentially little entanglement, uh, the quantum processes that use exponentially little entanglement can be classically simulated by the simple argument of product states that we started at the very beginning is just a slight tweaking of that. So therefore, you wouldn't expect this argument to work. So, and, the, and th then the reason it breaks down here is that if you have, exp if a psilon is exponentially small, for this argument to work, in order, you're, you're only doing your actual quantum computation with exponentially small amplitude, that epsilon. So in order to see that, to notice it against the background of all zeros, you have to sample that distribution many, many times. You need very fine accuracy for your Q. And, and indeed, the Chernoff bound will imply that you need exponentially many samplings in order to detect that exponentially small effect. Uh, so yeah, 
それとね。Are there no more questions? Okay, so let's thank the speaker. Thank you.